that's me. Um, I figure when you work with a really fun photographer and you get some really whimsical photos of yourself, you should use them when you get the chance, right? And since we're going to be talking about some sort of weird but also brainy stuff about our lives, I'm going to throw in some fun pictures when I have the chance. Um, so without habits, a path of purpose. Now, I wrote this title when we started talking about me speaking tonight a couple weeks, months ago. I was like, OK, what am I going to talk about with the study that I did and the book that I wrote without habits, dot, 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 a path to purpose. And the word nerds in the audience, I'm a writer, I'm a journalist, so I really like words, obviously. Uh, fellow word nerds might have noticed that I changed the title a tiny bit. Your program, the website says a path to purpose. Now I'm saying a path of purpose. And that's because when I came up with the title, I was like, oh, well, I want like, something I can deliver on, right? Like That's what we're supposed to do in wellness and personal growth and self-care. We're supposed to like promise you something that you can then deliver on. So like a path to purpose seems like directional. Like you do go without habits, dot, 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 get to a path. The path leads you to your purpose. But then when I started figuring out what I was actually going to talk to you guys about tonight and the study that I did and then the book that I eventually wrote about that study, I don't really agree with the idea of product from you know, a to-do list with personal growth and self-care. That's not really the study that I did and that's not really the book that I wrote. And in speaking even the past couple months about it, like this is a process right now. Me being on the stage and you being here, us being together is a process. So I'm about process and progress. So a path of purpose. Let's see what I'm thinking in that, right? As we spend the next hour together. So this is our path. I'm just kidding. <laughs> this is not our path. This is like really aspirational, right? This Anne Shirley, um, Jane Austen like path. And I really love Jane Austen. Anybody here like Jane Austen? And Shirley, okay, right, so there's yeah, the ladies, thank you. So this, I feel like, is what the wellness world wants our path to look like that we aspire to. Or at least it does when you're a journalist and you're on stock photo sites a lot, and you go in and you type in path, this is what comes up. It's like, oh, this is what I'm supposed to aspire to if I just take care of myself. Here were some other options. So I was like, oh, if I just do the self-care stuff, that's going to be me. Like, that's never been me. I don't know about you. I've never walked on a path like that. I've never been like, oh, yeah, that's what my life is going to be. So if this is our aspirational path, well, then this aspiration doesn't really work for me personally. I don't know about you. Because life can be really hard, right? Does anybody here, I know the lights are down, but I can see you and you can sort of see each other. Um, let's see where we might sort of have some similarities and differences between us in this room. Uh, does anybody in this room have a problem with working too much at their job, working long hours or studying too hard? Okay, yeah, thank you brave people who raised your hands like me too. I am a huge workaholic. I inherited a really strong work ethic from both of my parents, and I love to work. We can love to work, right? Now, when I've done these presentations before, I've thrown a lot of statistics about our societal overwork. And my mother and grandfather who are here, their eyes like glaze over and they fall asleep. And so I was like, I'm going to cut that part. I'm not going to do that. But I think we can all, uh, many of us at least, can relate to this idea of overworking. Overworking sometimes to the detriment of our relationships, overworking to the detriment of our physical health overworking to the detriment of just the things that make us happy. And sometimes, yes, this comes from the outside in, and sometimes we do this to ourselves because some of us really just love our jobs or just love being productive and contributing to society. Um, how else can life be a little bit hard for us? Uh, anybody here, all right, who here loves their entire relationship with social media? Just feels like it's the best thing in the world. Please raise your hand very high. OK, that's what I thought. I was hoping to get some guidance tonight, but evidently none of us feel totally cool with social media. Because of whether we're using it for our personal pleasure and connecting with friends, or we are, feel like we work a lot and we have to be a brand if we're not a business, Like we have very conflicted feelings about social media often, whether we feel like we have to be on it and don't want to be, or whether we find ourselves constantly scrolling on social media and not realizing that we've been scrolling for 45 minutes or something like that. It can be very overwhelming. Um, anyone here have a hard time making healthy food choices? Anyone? OK, yeah, sometimes, right, yeah. I mean, it's really hard. When you go into a grocery store now, it's no longer like, do I want the potato or the potato chips? 
It's like, do I want the kale or the kale chips? Or the peas or the pea chip? Who's gonna choose like kale over kale chips if we could? <laughs> and those are the healthy options. When we're trying to eat well, we've got all of this packaged food. We all have, if it's not a sugar addiction, it's a salt addiction. There's just all the stuff that we have. So all this stuff can be very overwhelming. And I haven't even gotten to the official habits that we often talk about trying to break or the better ones that we try to make. But there's so many ways in our lives. Auto binge watching of television, constant media overflux, the shopping problems that we have, because click, click, Amazon in two days, awesome. All the stuff that's coming at us. But one of the best visualizations I was given in some of the hundreds of interviews that I've done, which is just the best job in the world, was by um, Amber Case. Amber is a uh, tech designer and the former CEO of a tech company out west and a cyborg anthropologist. So she uh, basically observes the effect of our online selves on our real life selves. And when I was talking to her about this sort of overwhelm, she referred me to a TED Talk, and we were discussing that she did, one of the most uh, watched TED Talks of all time. We are all cyborgs now. And we were talking about this overwhelm, and she described it wonderfully, uh, like this I Love Lucy episode, I don't know if anybody's familiar, where Lucy and Ethel are in the candy factory, and they're in this candy factory, and all this candy is coming down the conveyor belt at them, and their job is to unwrap the candy before it goes into the next room. And so the candy's coming down, and they're like, oh, they're fine, you know, they're just unwrapping the candy, and everything's happy. And then all of a sudden, the candy starts coming faster. Okay, and they're getting a little bit frantic, and then it's coming faster, and so they start shoving a little bit of candy down their uniform. And then the candy starts going into their bonnets, and they're shoving food candy in their mouths, and then all of a sudden, they look like this. <laughs> and she said, this is us. This is what happens to us with all this stuff coming at us, that our lives now are architected by panic. We live in a period of panic architecture. So what does this have to do with habits, and why am I here talking about it? So I'm an interviewer and a journalist. I um, love just sort of getting an idea, being presented an idea by a client, by somebody who wants me to write about them. And if it sparks my interest, I do a lot of research. And then I start interviewing. I start asking questions. And when you ask a lot of questions, the whole world can open up, and then I get to share what I learn. It's fascinating. So I do that for magazines. I do that for websites. And I do that for podcasts. For two years, I was the producer and co-host of a podcast called Love Bites Radio, which was interview-based. And I'm currently working on a new one that will be interview-based that will be launched in fall, early winter. Very, very exciting. So in interviewing people, I often ask about the why behind what they do. Why we do what we do, why and how we love what we love, what makes our tails wag. And I started observing over the years this sort of rising overwhelm in people that I talk to. And so along those lines, I'm interviewing people who are in not specifically the wellness self-care world, but people who are trying to better the world. So whether it's a chef trying to help people with more intuitive eating, or whether it's authors with forms of self-care books, self-help books, um, a lot of business CEOs trying to help other people with their businesses. It seemed that a lot of the stuff that we're supposed to do for self-betterment is sort of just adding stuff onto the conveyor belt. Like, we're really busy people often. And so when we're trying to better our lives, when we're trying to move ourselves forward, sometimes it just feels like, oh, it's, just a, it's another diet that I need to do. It's, another, it's somebody else's you know, productive habits. The, the most highly productive habits of the most powerful people or you know, whatever variation of that title. Um, and that can be, in itself, another period of, of overwhelm. So what do I mean by habit when I, th when I propose, well, what if we just take out one habit that's not serving us well instead of try to flip the narrative and add a new one on? What do I mean by habit? I'm going to break it down into something, hopefully, that we can all relate to. So change the path, let's talk about the staircase. So let's think about the idea of just going down a flight of stairs. And for those of us who cannot easily go down a flight of stairs because of disability or illness or injury, if you can just change the image a little bit, maybe think about uh, using a mobility aid, a wheelchair to go down um, a hallway, uh, a, a cane or um, whatever you need just to sort of get from one place that you routinely go to another, or if you are often, most often in bed, even the idea of just lifting a glass up to your mouth, 
to something that you do over and over, a repeated physical motion. So when I talk about habit in the brain, from what I learned about habit in the brain, when I wake up in the morning, when we wake up in the morning, so let's just say we throw on a robe, throw on a sweatshirt, go to the bathroom, get to the top of the stairs. I want to go down the stairs because at the bottom of the stairs are the children who need to be fed or the coffee that we want to be made or uh, the animal that needs to be let out. So we just need to get to the bottom of the stairs. Now, when we get to the top of the stairs, do we conscientiously think, okay, now I have to extend my left arm and open up my left fingers to grip the railing while I simultaneously shift the weight of my body onto my right leg, starting to bend my right knee, rolling my weight onto my right hip, lifting my left leg at the same time with the heel of my foot, the ball of my foot, lifting my leg up into the air, moving it forward, I don't know, is that 12 inches, whatever that is, pressing my heel down. Now I'm shifting the weight from one to the other. Now, I, this is really hard to say as I'm doing it, um, but you get the idea. Like we're not, if I, I'm, we don't have to think through everything we're doing while we're doing to go down the stairs, right? Any, right? Yeah? Okay. You're with me? Great. We just walk down the stairs. Most of the time, multitasking. Most of the time, yelling at the dog, or me not, trying not to trip over my dog because she's tiny, or calling to our kids, or carrying a kid, or carrying laundry, or scrolling on our phone. We're doing something else at the same time. And we can do that because of these wonderful brains that we have. That walking down the stairs, which I'm calling our habit here, our routine, is performed by a part of the brain primarily called the basal ganglia in, in the temporal lobe. And that's responsible for memory and motor control and things like that, versus other parts of the brain where we are learning new information and taking and processing new information. Um, this is an oversimplification, obviously, but think about the idea of taking in you know, sound. So you're taking in sound, and it's going you know, from your ears into this auditory, uh, this auditory pathway that we have. So first, it's like, oh, is that a person, an animal, a machine? All right, it's a person. Is it somebody I know or I don't know? Is it a male or female? OK, I'm in conversation with someone. So I'm processing these thoughts as they are coming forward and forward, mixing with other things, mixing with uh, things coming in through my eyes. My, I'm seeing facial expression and body language, which hopefully, if we are actively paying attention like you all are right now, all of these things are coming into your brain. They're meeting up here in the frontal lobe. We're formulating thoughts and opinions. That is active thought when we are actively paying attention versus what's happening in the basal ganglia and the temporal lobe, where we can just walk down the steps, active and passive, not passive, uh, but inactive thought at the same time. So it sort of looks like this in this simplified Crayola version. And because of these amazing parts of the brain, we can prioritize and multitask. And it also can regulate all the stuff happening in our body, too. All of this stuff is coming together. But we didn't know always how to just walk up and down stairs without thought, right? We had to learn how to do that. As babies, we first figure out how to crawl, and then we push up. And then hopefully with supervision, we're toddling a few steps. Then eventually we make it to the stairs. And because of all of these different areas in our brain actively working together, knowing right from left, body orientation, understanding language, if somebody is helping us sort of learn how to guiding us up and down the stairs, um, problem-solving, balance, coordination of voluntary movement, things like that. We're learning how to go up and down the stairs. We're doing this by routine, 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 routine. And eventually, these things become habit and memory. So it takes a long time. It can take months and years to learn for our brain to make something into a habit, to make these patterns for us. But researchers have recently learned, well, not recently, you know, a couple decades have learned, that our brain is so good at actually turning routine into habit, that it's doing it for us when we're not aware and when we're not trying to make habit. So a couple of those things that we were talking about a few minutes ago, overwhelmed from work, if we're working in certain patterns and we get used to working certain hours and we get used to saying yes to certain things at work, that's eventually going to become just our go-to response to it. Um, the foods that we reach for, the way we use our media, those are going to become these sort of habits that we then are going to have to work so hard to break. And these are not just habits, obviously, in our brain. These are habits that, I mean, if you're listening, you're probably already thinking about the habits in your life that affect your, your mood, your heart, your body, your lifestyle. These affect us emotionally and intellectually, the, thing, the ones that trip us up a little bit. And the problem comes when those habits that we live in, the ones that just happen by routine, 
when we start just functioning in those patterns, and we forget the joy of just walking. We forget the joy of actually being focused with a book because we learned to read so long ago we can actually read pages without really paying attention, or driving a car. Remember when you first learned how to drive a car, how exciting that was, and how many of us are tuned out now? Or listening to music. All these things that we used to love when we first discovered them, eating a donut or a brownie, like the first time you eat the best donut in the world and how amazing it is, but then if you start eating donuts every day, not that exciting if you're not paying attention. Okay, so why does, um, why does this matter to me as a human on top of a journalist, and why did I dive into a personal study about this? Well, um, so a couple years ago, 2016, I say that I was sick, single, broke, and wandering in a fog. And that came from, in a way, the work that I do and the place that I was at in my life. So I'm a journalist. I write for magazines and websites. And despite sort of really loving what I do and being relatively good at it, like having respect of, of my, my peers and such, um, I was just, work wasn't going right. I was going further into debt, um, which can happen as a freelance writer. <laughs> you know, it's a hard thing to make a, a decent living at in general. Um, but it's even harder when you have a chronic illness. I got Lyme disease when I was 12 years old. I was actually in a wheelchair for a while for it. Um, so the joy of walking is still very significant for me. It was late diagnosed, so it repeated when I was in college and then turned chronic. I'm one of the 30 to 40% of us who are late diagnosed who have chronic conditions. Um, I now have six diagnosed autoimmune and inflammatory uh, diagnoses. Um, and that was just getting worse three years ago. And no matter how many diets I tried to do, if you're already thinking like, oh, you should try this, chances are I've done it or something very similar to it. Because when you're sick, you work to get better. You really work your illness. So I had done so many different diets, so many different lifestyle changes, Eastern and Western. I had seen these amazing doctors. Doctors are wonderful. I believe in medicine. I believe in Western practices. I believe in Eastern practices. And I was still getting sicker. And then despite hosting Love Bites Radio, which is an interview podcast about dating and relationships, where I'd be asking all of these questions, then my co-host and I going out into the field and trying this on our dating lives. I was, I was really single and had been for years. At 34 years old, I really wanted to be in love. I hadn't been in a long time. And that was just getting harder. That was getting really, really hard. So I observe this overwhelm and the people I'm interviewing. I feel this overwhelm in myself. And I decide, OK, enough. Let's just take one thing out and see what happens. I'm just going to turn this sort of rabbit hole curiosity I have on my, on my clients, my subjects, I was going to say. That sounds a little darker. My clients <laughs> on myself. I'm going to do some research. I'm going to observe and take notes. I'm going to interview and talk to people. And we're going to see what happens. So no social media for 40 days. Um, please raise your hand if that, ooh, somebody went, yeah. So please, yeah, if that sounds awesome to you, please raise your hand. Like the best gift you could give yourself, right? OK, now if that sounds like the scariest thing you could possibly do, please raise your hand. Fewer than I thought, actually. OK, actually fewer than I thought. I was petrified of this idea. Like when you work a lot, when you're on social media, it can sound like very scary. Not to, and this is not a, a specific age thing. Like across demographics, again, there's a lot of statistics we can throw at this. Across demographics, we are on Facebook all the time, Instagram all the time. Um, I've sort of broken up with Twitter, as many of us have, but well, actually, no, I tweeted today. That's a lie. I tweeted a lot today. Totally lying. Okay. Anyway, going back to 2016, actually, June 20th, 2016, this is my three year anniversary, and this is the second time I remembered that today. So today is very exciting for me. Three years ago today, I went off social media entirely. Yeah, very exciting. So here's what I noticed the first day, wake up, can't pick up the phone. Because that's immediately what I do first thing in the morning. That's what a lot of us do first thing in the morning, right? You grab your phone and you check in. So great, 45 minutes saved. Wonderful. Great, yeah, yeah, that's how much it was. So, all right, what else do I notice? I work at home by myself, plugged into my computer, and then as soon as I go to take a brain break, I want to go on to get a new browser page and check Twitter. Okay, just notice that I did that. Fine. What else do I notice that first day? As soon as I get up to go make a cup of tea, I want that phone to go with me. Every single time I get it from my desk, I go to reach for that phone to scroll Instagram. While I'm making my tea, while the tea water is boiling, I have no idea what to do because I'm not just scrolling. All right, manageable first day. Day three, I go to a work social event and I walk in and realize, oh, I don't know anybody. 
That's a great feeling, right? When you go to a networking thing and you're like, oh, why, wonderful. So instead of just like grabbing a drink and looking busy in my phone and feeling, all right, oh, I'm so important, I've got stuff to do, I put down the bag and I do what we're told to do at this stuff and I walk up to people and say like, hi, I'm Jacqueline, who are you? Yeah, nice to meet you, great, and I talk. And I do that again and I do that again and it gets a little bit more comfortable as I do it and it's really, it feels vulnerable and I feel sticky and I'm sweating a little and it's really gross, but like I do it and okay, that's manageable. Day 10. Now, this is not a pretty stock photo picture. This is my brother's back porch. My brother and his girlfriend own a home on this beautiful little house in the East Norwalk, South, South Norwalk border. And every summer, I uh, watch it for a weekend or two. Whenever they go away, I watch their dog. They have a big dog, I have a little dog, so I watch their dog. So 10 days into this study, here's what I'm learning about my social media have it without. It's a beautiful, let me paint a picture for you because it is a very different day than we're experiencing today. It is a perfect early summer day in Connecticut. It is, there's no humidity. There is not a cloud in the sky. It is the most beautiful, it's like 78 degrees and it's dry and the sky is blue. It's a Friday afternoon and I'm outside in the yard with the dogs and the grass is green and you, can, you can't really see it, but you see there's like flowers tumbling out of planters and beyond this photo there's a yard so I'm sitting on the deck looking the other way and the dogs are lolling in the grass and it's just gorgeous. It is picture perfect, like I can smell barbecue from other yards and I can hear people and I'm sitting there and I've got a glass of wine and my feet are up and it's just, God, it's beautiful. It's... So I'm sitting there and then I realize, okay, no reason to pick up the phone. What do I do? It's Friday afternoon. I have no plans Friday night. I have no plans on Saturday. I have no plans on Saturday night. I have no plans on Sunday. I have no plans on Sunday night. Nobody is going to be calling me to check in. I'm not responsible for anyone. What do I do? Now to the parents in this audience, I understand what I just described might be like the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. <laughs> and to those of you in school that have nothing but studying to do, I get the idea of having no responsibilities. Sounds amazing. <laughs> but I ask you to stick with me because 34 years old, Sick, single, and broke, and someone who is a freelance writer and a sick person, I spend about 75% of my time alone. I'm rarely in rooms with this many people. Socialization is a big deal to me. And so at that time, three years ago, not being able to go in my phone and take a beautiful photo of the scene in front of me and share it on Instagram and have people tell me, oh my God, you're having such a beautiful day. Or go on Twitter, yeah, right? You like to get that back. <laughs> or to go on Twitter and just jump into somebody's conversation or to go on Facebook and see what everybody I knew was doing so to sort of feel like I was there and knew what was going on in people's lives. This felt so petrifying all of a sudden. I sat there and I was like, wow, I am alone. I am isolated. I am unloved. <gasps> I am unlovable. It got dark, all right? So here is what's happening when we talk about habit in this moment. I'm gonna break out of the darkness for a second. In the 1990s, a group of MIT researchers led by Anne Grebel uh, came up with what we now commonly refer to as the habit loop. So habits are stored in this cue, routine, reward loop. So to use our top of the stairs sort of image there, you get to the top of the stairs. Being at the top of the stairs with stairs in front of you, you just can't topple down, obviously. That's a physical cue going down the stairs. That bodily motion is the routine. The reward is the person or the thing or whatever that's at the bottom of the stairs. I could give a lot of other examples. That's sort of a basic cue routine reward. So with me in social media, here's my habit loop. Ha, ha silly picture's back. Okay, so a, a cue could be, I feel this. I feel sad, I feel scared, I feel bored, I feel alone, whatever that emotional cue is. Um, emotional cues are very common for me when I don't feel well, ah, oh, I just need to be connected. I feel sad, I feel bad about myself. I reach for social media. I feel, ah, oh, okay, I'm connected. I feel back in control. I feel like I'm a part of something, wonderful. Another cue, the physical cues. I get up from my desk, that became a physical cue. I get up from my desk, I change whatever I'm doing, my physical posture, that's a physical cue. Um, routine, a social media reward is, yeah, I feel better. So what do most self-help programs want us to do 
if we are taking out the routine, which in my case is obviously taking out the social media, they want us to swap in a better one most of the time, right? So if you feel something bad, you obviously don't want to feel something bad and you're going to do something else. Or if you're trying to break a habit, you're going to put a healthier habit in there. And when we're talking about things like, um, like recovering from trauma or breaking from an addiction, this is definitely by far the way to go. And that's why such programs like AA are very successful in support groups, because we're putting in a healthier routine to get to the same emotional or in a better reward. So I'm definitely not poo-pooing putting in a good routine. And then even sometimes we just need to compartmentalize. And so we add a new routine in just because it's appropriate at the time just to do something temporary and better for ourselves, to distract, to change the narrative, to choose a different story. So sometimes, yeah, just putting a new routine in is great, which is what I tried to do that day. I'm feeling horrible, I'm unlovable, I'm horrible, I'm crying. Okay, I need to just change this right now. So I grab the dogs and I go down to South Norwalk, then I'm walking on the walk. Water. And so, yeah, all right, people. Now I'm around people. And I'm saying hi to strangers who I don't know. And I'm working with the dogs. And oh, great, the sun is better. And it's wonderful. But here's the problem if we actually have real stuff to work on. If we're trying to just sort of change our lives, if we're trying to really figure out who we are, if we have any sort of sick, single, broke thing going on in our lives, which I don't think is uncommon at all. I'm not unique in this. We all get to points in our lives, right, where we don't have what we thought we'd have. Whether we're coming out of school and don't get the job we want, whether we don't have the partner we want by a certain age, whether, whether we're not married, or we don't have the children, or we don't have the home, or we get those things and then lose them, or they're in balance, they're out of balance, sorry, they're in out of balance. We have them, we lose them, we have problems within them, with our relationships, with our family. These are sort of hard things to figure out. We all get to points in our lives that come and go where we just really need to work on these deeper issues. And so sometimes it's like, um, it's like opening up a wound. So you take a bandage off. So in this case, social media in a way was like ripping off a bandage. And instead of you know, just plopping another dirty bandage on a wound, I'm actually like opening it and cleaning it and like helping it heal for real. And so I just go back to the porch and sit. And so the thing about going without habit, just taking it out and figuring out what the wound even is and not replacing it with a routine is that it starts opening you up to questions. No matter what the habit itself is, it doesn't matter, it's not social media specific, whatever the habit is, is all of a sudden when you're stuck in that moment of feeling and you can't just reach for the bandage it's, okay, well, what am I feeling? Why am I feeling this? Do I really want the bandage that I reached for? Like, do I really want to go on social media right now? Do I really want the donut? Do I really want to go shopping? Whatever, whatever the thing is that we normally reach for when we feel something, do I really need it? How do I feel about myself with that? Using our stairs more metaphor here, it's like getting, to, it's like, you know, when you're sort of halfway down a flight of steps and all of a sudden you start falling because you realize like, oh, I'm, running, I'm going down steps and like you don't really know how to actually go down steps. It's because you've gone from that like memory routine place to this active place in your mind and all of a sudden it's really scary because you don't know what's going on because you're active and you're present. So what, these questions, why did I reach for that? How did that become my band-aid? And then if you stick for this for more than, you know, a day or a week, or you add another habit onto it, or you keep exploring this wound, or you open up another one, where did that desire come from? Um, or was it a craving actually from my body? Is it a genuine craving? Or is it something that came to me from societal messages? We get a lot of messaging from you know, billboards and books that we read and people talking to us and giving us their ideas. Like, all right, if it's a message from my family or from my religion or from my relationships, do I actually buy into those messages? Do I agree with them? Do I want something else? Do I agree with something else a little bit more? Does that feel more genuine to who I am? Maybe can I change my priorities in life so that I live more by that person that I want to be and feel I am versus the person I've been acting as that maybe is coming in from all of these messages that are coming to me? What do I value? How can I reprioritize my life to maybe work with those values a little bit more? Can I be braver in the choices that I make? Whether it's about choosing things that are about what I buy, or how I speak, or who I have in my life, or don't. Can I have a little bit more fun with things? What do I want? What do I need? What do I value? And those get us per closer to this path of purpose 
thing. Now, in the um, many, many people that I've interviewed, CFOs and CFOs and fascinating artists and chefs and authors and performers and really cool people who are very generous with their, their thoughts and their, their hearts and their work, when I ask people, like, what is your purpose, they often respond with, you know, their jobs, or at least with active words. I make this, I do this, I teach this, I share this, things like that. And that's great. Um, I think if our jobs especially are our passions, then having that as our purpose makes sense. Um, but beyond the what, when we start talking about like why and how, we get into sort of these deeper connections that we all have that go into this sort of purpose part. And this goes into sort of the reward that we get for making these changes and not living so much by routine and uh, making more active choices in our lives. Now, I did not know this when I did this study for through the year, this next part. Um, I did not even know this a lot of the times when I was interviewing people about it, but it seemed quite fitting that I think a lot of the things that we share can be broken down into what psychologists now, for a long time, many of them refer to as these four psychological need groups, things that whether we think we are reaching for something for a more superficial purpose, we actually have this drive within us for these, I think there's like 11 needs, but they've sort of put them into four need groups. So we feel comfortable, happy, fulfilled when we have safety, when we feel safe and secure, when we have a home, food, warmth, companionship, health care, and consistency in these. Um, if you want to learn more about all of these, I uh, took this from Tim Kasser's The High Price of Materialism, one of the most fascinating books I, I researched for my project, for my study. So safety often is you know, affiliated with finances. Obviously, we need some level of financial security in order to have the physical comforts that we need as human beings to survive. So a home, food, warmth, and we know that we're going to have them tomorrow, too. Competency and self-esteem. We feel skilled enough to do the task in front of us or are engaged in the learning of it. And this, to me, is an incredibly fun one because how many of us have been told, oh, you're good at this, and so that's the thing you do, and you actually like, don't maybe get excited to like, learn other things because learning things is hard. So if we can actually be, yeah, good at the stuff that we love to do, but also be excited and curious to learn more and to try new things and to not feel like, oh, well, I have to learn how to do this craft so quickly so that I can be awesome on, on Instagram, but actually enjoy the process of learning something, you know? So competency and self-esteem that we enjoy and feel good about ourselves just for engaging in the work that we're doing. Connectedness. We need to feel a part of a community and connected to our partners and ourselves. So a lot of things obviously threaten this nowadays. Social media, our inactive work environments, a lot of us are working more remotely. Um, the, the delivery culture versus dining in restaurants. And this is not about introversion, introversion versus extroversion. This is introverts can be just as socially connected as extroverts. This is about social isolation. So thank you for coming tonight. Coming out together into a space is a really, really wonderful thing. So thank you to this festival. Thank you for being here. And autonomy and authenticity. We choose for ourselves and live as who we want to be. And this can be a really hard one because we are born in these bodies and we don't get a choice about them. We don't get a choice about some of the things that as we move through the world, other people, other groups tell us that is not right or that is hard. We cannot just change our scenario sometimes because of the, the little things that with the pods that we live and move around in. We can be part of the change for things. We can express ourselves in certain ways. We cannot be held back sometimes by the limitations of them. But we all don't just have you know, the same snow globe. I don't know why I said snow globe, um, <laughs> but you get what I mean. We all just don't have quite the autonomy uh, that, we, that we could have if you know, we all have the same sort of cases that we walk around in. Um, but when it comes to habit, I love this one. Because despite these things that we live in, and despite not getting the job, or not having the partner, or not getting the house, or not having the children, or those things coming and going, we often feel like we don't have choices. And especially being in the chronic illness community a lot, I feel like a lot of us really inside of these bodies that hurt us feel like, well, I don't have a choice in what I do, or how I think, or how I feel. I can't push this needle forward. And I know other 
people and other groups with restrictions and limitations and people who don't, we often feel like we don't have a choice. And taking out the habit, taking out that routine and finding yourself constantly throughout the day stopped in those moments where you reach for that thing makes you realize how many choices in a day we actually have where we could do one thing but we do another. So why do we feel like we don't have choices? Why do we feel like all of this stuff is just coming in and it's part of the way things are? My favorite image for this also comes from the I Love Lucy woman, Amber Case. <laughs> She's great with these things. So I asked her flat out, I was like, well, why do we feel like this the way, is the way the world is? Why do we get to the like, I have to be on social media, right? I can't quit social media. I'm a writer and a podcaster. People have to know about the work that I do. I can't just get rid of it. Like, why? Like, how? And then I'm like, wait, how did I get that way? Of course I can quit if I want. I'm a, I can do what I want. I can quit social media. I was like, how did I get this way? And she was like, oh, well, norms and anthropology. I was like, what do you mean? And she said, we are the frog and the pot of water, slowly realizing it's coming to a boil. That is the world around us. We grow up in these societies, like, you know, time changes and things happen, and all of a sudden this is the way the world is, and we're just part of it. And so I thought about that for a long time, even up till today. Like, I wrote about that in the book, and even then my ideas of it have sort of changed. Because we're not the frog, I decided. If we were the frog, right, like we're not the frog, because the frog is just in the water, and like, yeah, it could jump from the pot, but we're making the soup around us, too. Like, if we were the frog, then we'd be like jumping out of the pot and cutting celery and carrots and onions and like bringing them back into the pot and making the soup, because now I'm making this a soup. You know, like, like we have part of it. Like, we'd be like adjusting the flame, because like me being on social media is making a world where we have to be on social media. Me eating, like me buying the things in the store is contributing, like all of us doing that is making the soup together. So like, yeah, like if we're gonna stick with this, like yeah, we could be the frogs who jump from the pot, but then we can also like turn down the flame for the other frogs in the pot, right? So in those little moments of, ah, I can't reach for the thing, I have a choice, we can make sometimes the hard but better choice. That just means being attentive to all the little moments that we have and then making those choices based on the wants and the needs and the values that we discover. Things that leading to those deeper, deeper, deeper rewards. So what does this feel like once you've gone through, I will be honest, months of, ow, what is this feeling? Ow, this hurts, exposing these wounds. So originally, I, for tonight, I had like lots of examples from things that I did through the year. And these are things that I write about sort of in the book. I go through specific habits, social media, sugar, shopping, negative thought, holiday gifting, um, lots of different things. And I do research around society, why we've gotten this way, um, our economic hedonic treadmill, dopamine in the brain. I mean, lots, you know, if we're addicted or not addicted. So there's a lot of that kind of study around what I did for myself and this study. I interview a lot of wonderful people. And then I've talked to people since then who have started taking their own habits out and having their own results. But I don't necessarily want to share those with you because this is really a self-self-help thing. You know, like what happens to, to me and to the people who've done this is not necessarily going to happen to anybody else. Um, but I will say that aside from these specific things that can happen for us, once we've done this really weird work of figuring out what do I want, what do I need, who am I, <laughs> why do I feel this way, what do I believe, can I prioritize and make healthier choices, and then we start doing the work of making those choices over and over, sometimes failing once, failing twice. You know, you want to make the call to a person. Most of the time we don't make the call. that we, oh, I'm going to call that person, and I don't call that person. And then time goes by, and that friendship phrase you don't see that relative, that person passes away, or you have to have a hard conversation with someone and you really don't want to have it. Once you start recognizing, oh, my relationships, I'm a lonely person, I'm disconnected, my relationships really mean a lot to me, so I've got to work on them. You can't just stop after that first phone call if it doesn't go right, right? You have to keep on trying. You have to keep on trying different tactics to figure out how I get to these things that mean so much more. Even if you don't know what they are, you know here, what they are. Those questions help you figure out what's missing. So sometimes now, once you've sort of done that work, you get a cue for something, and yeah, you might reach for a healthier routine because those happen as you're getting rid of the bad ones. If you stop watching TV for a while, 
You fall back in love with reading books, maybe, or um, going for nature walks, or going to the gym, just because you realize, oh God, I love doing that, and I was wasting a lot of time, you know, with Netflix asking me if I'm still there, which <laughs> it does to me a lot, because I really love television. Are you still there? Like, yeah, don't judge me, I'm still here. But if you take that out for a while, which by the way, I failed doing twice, taking out television, um, if you take out television for a while and you rediscover other things, then yeah, sometimes you're naturally going to reach for those things that you love rather than going to watch television. But aside from that, if you get any sort of cue or just pause in your day where you have a choice to make, you just start asking yourself, well, what do I need right now? How can I make the best out of this situation? What do I need? What do I want to do right now? And you can sort of weigh out short-term satisfactions, which might be watching television or eating the donut or going on social media if that feels good in that moment. But then you also consider these long-term goals and values and these deeper things. And now I love how um, heated some people can get about the word change. Some people are like, ah, oh, no, you can't change. Nobody changes. And then a lot of people in the wellness world are like, oh, we change with every breath. Like right now we're all changing, right? Because things are coming in and out of our bodies and nothing is, yeah. Right. Um, but so this porch became a very significant sort of thing for me, because like I said, I'm there every summer. 2016, miserable, lonely, crying, panic attack. 2017, 2018, I'll be that back there next, next week again. And I said I started with a single, sick, broke trifecta. I also said I'm not going to deliver on anything. So it's not, I mean, I just will tell you, I'm not like now married and a millionaire and, you know, my illness isn't gone. <laughs> But every time I've gone back to that porch, I've sort of lived a new experience. I will tell you, from 2016 to 2017, I was entirely changed emotionally from this study. I was alone for the weekend, and it was amazing. And then 2018 was a little bit different, and 2019, I'm sure it's going to be a little bit different, because those, I think the single stick broke sort of works as a, as a you know, whatever. We have work, relationships, and health are pretty big things for all of us. And those are the things that come and go, and we can't really control them, right? So those are always gonna sort of come and go. But sort of the presence of being in the same place, I guess it's sort of part of the routine, or you know, you get cued from same things, but that porch, it's sort of just being present with whatever that weekend is going to be, and not trying to make it something it's not. And so whatever metaphorical porch you happen to keep finding yourself returning to, or this, I like it the more and more I look at it. It's been a couple days. But this aspirational path <laughs> that we seek out, whatever we're sort of finding ourselves on, the thing that we can control is what we do in those moments, right? Now, I can't tell if I'm making any of this sound easy or hard, and I said I'm not going to deliver a promise of anything. Um, but it is work. That's where like the dot, dot, dot is. That's why I just put a dot, dot, dot there. <laughs> like, without habits, dot, 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 a path of purpose. Because it does take being uncomfortable and failing and rising back up again and failing and rising back up. Um, and so if it does sound a little weird and, or scary or intimidating, you're like, ah, I'm just not sure. Um, I interviewed Rocco Bellick for this study. He's a filmmaker um, now out in California. He directed the documentary Happy, which is on Netflix, and it is delightful. If you're in a bad mood, poop, you're in a good mood afterwards. It's amazing. So I interviewed him for the study, and we talked for a long time about all the things we had both learned. And then we just sort of got to talking about how our lives had changed from all of this work we had done studying this stuff. So he's studying happiness directly. He's interviewing you know, doctors and psychologists and people who've risen after trauma, and he's going around the world studying politicians in the happiest societies on earth. I'm interviewing psychologists and artists and wellness people and uh, neuroscientists and doctors and things like that, talking about habit, and our lives have changed from it. And so I ask him, and he's, and he's like, oh, I don't want to sound too Pollyanna, at one point he says. And I was like, well, what would you say to people who are nervous about, like, the Pollyanna part of all of this? And he just said, well, I would just say it's worth it. It's worth it to do all this weird, hippy-dippy work. It's worth it to, do, to have the hard conversations. It's worth it to like bring in and just try ideas. It's worth it to, have, to face some discomfort. Um, 
because once you make some big choices, and he made big choices, he moved to a different part of the country, he shifted the kind of documentary work he was doing, he went from being the sort of gruff, dramatic filmmaker to being somebody who now lives on the beach in California, um, you know, with his kids and his partner, and he's, you know, he's much more relaxed. He said it's worth it because you find yourself in these blissed out moments where you're just, poof, you're there. And it could be with a person in a conversation, or it could be if you love nature, like he described just being out on the water, that his best day where he's happiest could just be out in the water with his best friend on the surfboard, just being in the water with a good friend. It could be eating the most amazing donut or in New Haven, the best slice of pizza. You know, it's just being present in the moment and being like, wow, I'm here for this. And if that still sounds a little bit weird and hippy-dippy and intimidating for you, um, I'll leave you with one other bit of advice I was given for this project by Rebecca West. She is a designer out in Portland with the firm Happy Starts at Home. So she talks about the, her book of the same name, talks about almost like the psychology behind interior design and how we can actually build spaces that nurture uh, whatever we want at home. And so I sort of asked her the same thing because she talks very much about being confident in our space and how we dress and how we present and making that unique to ourselves. And so I sort of asked her the same thing. And she's like, well, just take one little tiny action step. It can be as simple as taking the garbage to the end of the street and then just recognizing you did that and congratulating yourself for that. Just one tiny little action step. And then you take another. Then you clear out something else. And you congratulate yourself for that. And then you do one thing and you congratulate yourself for that. And you get excited. You get excited about things again. And then after all these tiny little action steps, all of a sudden you find yourself on a hamster wheel of joy. <laughs> And I started laughing. I was like, I love that. She's like, yeah, I made it up. I knew you would. She just like made it up in the moment. This little hamster wheel of joy. That if we just take one little action step and then another and then another, we find ourselves on a hamster wheel of joy. And so the path of purpose is just living in these little moments of value and of pain and of sticky conversations and this muck of a world that we live in and of joy. So choosing is the purpose. Because like we're already on our path, right? We all get one path and we're already on it. Okay, that's what I got. Thank you very much.